So we're going to be talking about chapter one, good and bad reasoning. And so we're going to start off with some ideas about well, what is good reasoning and what is bad reasoning. And how do we know the difference? So we're trying to think critically about this. Now, this goes back to critical thinking, right? And what is really critical thinking? Critical thinking is when we're thinking about uh, issues in a well-reasoned manner. So when we talk about what, when we're rational, right, we form particular beliefs or reasons to why uh, such and such is true or it's not true, it's false, right? And so we have to take a look at the information that we're dealing with. So this is a great term. Not all information is created equal in the sense that this you can see in social media and other avenues of uh, information that, you know, just because it's printed, just because it's posted, doesn't mean that it's necessarily true or backed up very well. So we take a lot of information from, from other people, but do we really sit back and sort of deliberate and think about, well, is this good information? Is this bad information? Right. And so how do we? Say that there's particular terms, of course, joke to be learning in the class. So good reasoning we often call cogent reasoning. And bad reasoning is uh, malicious reasoning. So we're committing some sort of fallacy of reasoning. And we'll talk about that more in the class as we go along. So reasons and arguments. Now, an argument is consisted of premises, and we'll take what Premises are, are claims, they're, they're statements, they're reasons to a particular conclusions. Now, the conclusion itself is not an argument, and I think this is where people get confused. When I'm making an argument, I mean, I'm making a systematic pathway or, or a systematic blueprint on how to get to this particular conclusion. So it's kind of like maybe analogous to um, driving directions, right? That I'm giving you a step-by-step -step process on how to get to a particular place. And the conclusion is our location, it's the end point, right? And so the premises are the directions, individual directions to get to that particular place. And the whole thing, is what we're going to call an argument. So how do you know where the directions between and versus the the destination, right? So the premises are directions. When you're reading, you probably see terms like because, since, or. So because this is true, and since this is true, or for this reason, then you're going to get a conclusion, right? It's leading, these are directions to that conclusion. So how do you know it's an endpoint or conclusion? It may not always say these words, but these are good tips to kind of uh, give you a heads up that this is a conclusion. When it says hence, therefore, so, so it'll be something like because this fact and since this is true, and for this reason, hence, this must be true, or therefore, this is the conclusion. This is true, right? Now, exposition and argument. So only statements that provide reasons for believing something form arguments. This is where we have to kind of make a distinction between what's relevant information and what's not. And this is where we're saying, you know, not all information is created equal. So most forms of exposition include anecdotes, not really arguments. You get kind of confused about that. So when you say things like, um, well, that happened to my uncle, you know, or that's true. He, he never got cancer. He was smoking all the time. Those are really reasons to, for an argument, say if the conclusion is, you know, what are the chances of somebody getting cancer from smoking, you can't really try to prove or disprove that by saying, well, man, you know, he's still living, so 
you know. So that's what we're saying. It's careful about using anecdotes as uh, ways to form an argument. But see how it may imply an argument, right? So you say, well, it's maybe kind of true since that uncle didn't get cancer. So, right, but it's also not well founded. There has to be some good factual information you're going with, and not simply. Uh, some sort of story or something that you've heard or experience, particular experience, but may not apply to the general public, right? And we're going to get into that. So when we're talking about an explanation, an explanation is a form of exposition, but it's often confused with an argument. And this is where we get a lot of confusion as well. So if I give an explanation for something, this is why this engine works this way. And this is how my phone works, right? I'm explaining how the phone works, explaining how the car works, whatever. But that's not gonna get an argument about it. Uh, when we're talking about an argument, I'm trying to persuade somebody that the claim is true. I'm trying to give reason that this is why you should believe this is the case. Uh, not really simply just informing someone. It's like, oh, this is how it works. So when we talk about winning an argument, so I think there's also confusion here. Winning an argument is, it's not a fight. It's not a shouting match. It's not, you know, trying to just yell <laughs> whoever yells the loudest. To win an argument is to actually provide a good, logical, persuasive set of reasons or something to be true or something to be false. And you see this within law. This is why law also uh, practices. Um, well, they have to take laws before so they have to practice critical thinking because they're going to have to give you logical reasons and be persuasive as to why this is true or why this is not. Now, when we talk about cogent reasoning, premises are believable given what is already known. So this is where we're setting it up. So if we know this and we know this, and this is a good reason that we should follow, you know, this. So all likely relevant information is considered. And reasoning must be valid. Now this this is a kind of a technical term when we talk about valid. So there's two kinds of valid arguments, deductively valid. So that means if all the premises are true, all the reasons that you're kind of leading me to then the conclusion must be true. So like I was saying, you know, if it's true this, and it's also true that this, and this is what we know, and one falls from the other, then we can draw the conclusion, right? Now, inductively valid, you have conclusions going beyond what is contained in the premises. So this is where a lot of probability happens. Where you're making a good argument, but you can give me Every single pinpoint fact, you have to give me a probable cause. For it. You know, it is probably the case that this is true, given from what we know. Now, the two kinds of uh, valid arguments that you'll see a lot, they're not the only kinds, but these are just structures, uh, patterns that you'll see a lot. If A, then B, A, therefore B. And this is going back to the old. Uh, Latin term modus ponens, it's usually called modus ponens. So how this works, let's say these variables, A and B, would fill them with some sort of factual information. So if it rains, then the streets are wet. So raining is A and the streets are wet is B. So if it rains and the streets are wet, um, two says A, so it is raining. Make it a factual statement, it is raining. So therefore, B, the streets are wet. It's also a factual thing, so the conclusion. So notice, if it's raining and the streets are wet, I'm making these premises inference, right? One falls to the other. And if it is true that it is raining, therefore, then I have a good conclusion. I have the reasons to believe that the streets are wet. Now, the benefit for this is you can see I have clear beliefs about 
what is true and those beliefs follow into a well-established conclusion. Now, if I don't have these good, well-reasoned structures, then there's a liability. There's an increase of possibility of error that it could be wrong if I don't have the structure. Well, there could be all sorts of other factors if I don't have a well-structured argument. Now, this is a good note. Good reason is not bounded by being culturally relative. So what does that mean? Saying that you can have good reasons for a particular claim, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be based in the culture or be part of the culture to make a good argument. So maybe I'm not part of a particular culture, but I have good reasons to believe something is true regarding that culture, right? Uh, it is also not gender relative. So being a man or being a woman or any gender identity uh, doesn't make you immune or doesn't separate you from good reasons or not. So, you know, because I'm not a woman doesn't mean that it can, you know, give you some really per persuasive arguments about something that involves women, right? And so we talk about abortion and the issue that we'll talk about, you know, most likely in the, in, in the course that'll come up. And so coming with good reasons why women uh, should have access to abortion doesn't really, uh, it, it's not relevant to whether I'm a woman myself. I can identify good reasons uh, and not have to be a woman. And this is what also individuals. So, you know, you don't have to be a particular person to make a claim about something factual, right? Now, this is where we get a little, a little bit gray there, I admit, though, because we're going to get into philosophy of mind and, and what is real, what is not, what is accessible, what is not. But I would say in general that uh, most information is accessible for everybody. If I can see it, then you probably can see it as well. So some wrong ideas about it is that uh, that it that cannot that good cogent reasoning, right? Cannot conclude that most points is not valid. It cannot conclude that good reasoning differs from group to group. So this is a mistake that some make, and this is what I was kind of leading to in the last slide, that, you know, because I'm coming in with a good structure, the reason doesn't mean that, oh, well, these issues are relevant, right, whether I'm not female, I would, say, I would actually correct them and say that whether I'm a woman or a man, right, a person to person, those aren't necessarily good reasons. So some other wrong reasons about culture is that it said, oh, well, it's been a, it, the issue is really about self-interest or prejudice or narrow-mindedness, and that leads to poor reasoning. That's not necessarily the case. What really the issue is, and a lot of people miss this, is that they're not using good standards of what counts as good reasoning. So how do we even tell the difference between good reasoning or not is usually the issue, and not so much about uh, whether that person is prejudiced or self-interested. Somebody who may be self-interested actually may come up with some good reasons, unfortunately, right? Despite being self-interested. So those aren't necessarily relevant factors. And this is where we get to issues of background beliefs. So background beliefs are beliefs that we're coming into, you know, into the argument, into the situation. So, It's going to be difficult for us to develop good judgments if we're having beliefs when we're coming into it with already some biases, right? So kinds of background beliefs are beliefs as a matter of fact, about values. Well, what is a value? It, it, it's a position in regards to what is important and what is not. So capital punishment practice practiced in every society or is capital punishment justified? Uh, those are values. You say, well, if 
to believe that it's practicing. Every society in the airport must be justified in every single situation. That's going to influence a new situation, right? A new case that you hear. They're already kind of biased about, you know, what the conclusion should be. So a lot of our worldviews, a lot of our background biases or, or what we're coming in with is influenced by families, culture, friends. So we have to be a little bit ca cautious about that and conscientious that, you know, well, this is what my family's been telling me this whole time, or this is what my culture's been telling me this whole time. But then we have to kind of read that. Is that necessarily true? Is that always the case? And so they're deeply ingrained. They're not easy to kind of question. And you'll find this questioning yourself, you know, things that you've always assumed to be true and never really thought to change. They're going to take time, but you do, we should reconsider that. And insufficiently grounded beliefs, we should strongly consider our beliefs, this is what I'm saying, we've all, since just because we've always had these ideas or beliefs doesn't mean that they're really on firm ground, that they really have good reasons to believe them. So take a look, examine our background beliefs. Are they consistent? Are there contradictions in our, what we were brought up with? Um, so reason, the reasons to believe it or it seems to kind of be just made up, right? So what new information are we receiving and what information do we have to kind of question that we thought we already had? And this is why Socrates is famous for saying that unexamined life is how we're living. What does he mean by that? Saying, if you're not taking a look at your life, if you're just kind of going through the motions and saying, well, that's what my culture said, that's what my family said, you never really question, you're not really thinking for yourself. You're kind of just kind of going through the motions and being a passive follower. Already. It's not really living your life, you're kind of just going with the crowd. So two kinds of, of back important beliefs for background beliefs is you'll see this a lot, the nature, human nature. So a lot of people come with the assumption that well, all people are bad naturally, or all people are really born good naturally. See how that kind of belief will influence and make them biased towards particular things like capital punishment or crime, right? They're all they're already gonna come with some loaded ideas. And you have to kind of really question the reliability of that information. Where are we getting that information from? How did we come up with this notion that all people are born good or all these all people are born bad? And when we're doing so we should consider science, right? We should consider some well established science that, you know, so, well, wait a minute, what has psychology said so far with regards to human nature, right? Let's take a look at the science and not sit and say, well, you know, I kind of feel that all people are born bad. Well, how do we question that, right? How do we, how does that line up with information that we're already know? So these are the type of reasoning that we're going to take a look at this semester and start questioning our background beliefs start looking for patterns in our beliefs and in our conclusions and our arguments and how we kind of make sense of the world.